Hello everyone. Welcome to today's webinar by the Global Antibiotic Research and Development Partnership, GARDP. My name is Victor Kwasi, and I'll be hosting today's session on target candidate profiles and target pro product profiles for new antimicrobials. Revive is GARDP's education and outreach program. It aims to connect and support the antimicrobial R&D community by facilitating learning, sharing knowledge, and connecting people. These webinars are part of our educational activities. All webinars are recorded and freely available to view after the live session on our website, revive.garp.org slash webinars. As well as the webinar recordings, you can also read our series of articles known as antimicrobial viewpoints. Here our experts discuss various topics within the field and the most recent contribution is one from Rafael Bastos and Gustavo H. Goldman from the University of Sao Paulo on whether antifungal resistance arises in the environment. We also have a resources section that includes an antimicrobial encyclopedia. This has definitions of various important terms in the field, and some of these also include videos where experts give a further explanation on terms, such as urinary tract infections and bacteriophages. This resource is being continually expanded, so please do keep an eye out. As always, today's presentation will be followed by a Q&A session. You can submit your questions at any time during the webinar via the questions window in your webinar control panel, as shown on this slide. We will address the questions after the presentations and do our best to respond to as many as possible. Today's speakers are Shahul Hamid, Daniela Sinzi, and Valeria Gijanti. Unfortunately, Bala Subramanian is unable to join us today. Our moderator today is Sumati Nambia. Sumati is Senior Director of the Child Health Innovation and Leadership Department at Johnson & Johnson. Welcome, Sumati. I now hand over to you to introduce our speakers of today. Yeah, thanks, Victor. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Yeah, uh, thanks again. And I'd like to add my warm welcome to all of you and thank you for joining today's webinar on target candidate profiles and target product profiles for new antimicrobials. We've lined up three excellent speakers who will each cover the topic from a slightly different perspective and share with us some of their learnings over the years. We hope this webinar will help clarify how using the TPP process early and consistently in product development can maximize the efficiency and clarity of key development decisions, keeping in mind the paradigm of beginning with the end in mind. We'll start uh, with the presentation on target candidate profiles by Shahul Hamid, followed by Daniela Zinsi's presentation on TPPs from the pharmaceutical industry perspective, and close, by, uh, close with a presentation by Valeria Gigante uh, on TPPs from the WHO perspective. We look forward to receiving your questions and having a robust discussion during the Q&A session following the presentations. Our first speaker today is uh, Shahul Hamid. Uh, many thanks, Shahul, for stepping in at such short notice and helping out with today's webinar. Uh, Shahul leads discovery efforts at Bugworks and is an expert in medicinal chemistry and pharmaceutical sciences and has more than uh, two decades of experience in drug discovery uh, and development experience in anti-infectives, anti-inflammatory and oncology drug, drug discovery programs. Prior to joining uh, Bugworks, uh, Shahul was a team leader with AstraZeneca India Private Limited where he gained international exposure in structure-based drug design, structure activity relationship, and drug discovery. Shahul has led many lead generation and lead optimization products and has progressed many chemical series from early hit identification stages to preclinical development candidates. Um, so welcome, Shahul, and we look forward to hearing from you. Thanks, somebody, uh, for your kind words. Next slide. So, so the next uh, good morning and good afternoon and good evening, wherever you are in the part of the world. Uh, 
So next uh, 10 to 15 minutes, uh, I'll be covering the truck candidate profile for a novel antibacterial agent. Next slide, Victor. Slides are not moving. So, Shahu, do you see the slide with desperate need at the top? No, uh, it is there. The slide is, uh, uh, my profile slide is still showing. Okay, just a moment. Hopefully, it will change soon. Okay, thank you, thank you, Victor. So uh, we are all currently, what we are exper uh, experiencing the uh, multiple waves of current pandemic and it associated uh, a problem. As a result of it, what is the world is going through the ravaging uh, effect of COVID pandemic. And uh, it is also emphasizing that how important that we need to have a affordable medicine to address this such kind of pandemic and uh, COVID-19 has taught us a, a clear lesson. In the similar line, we also need to understand how important a drug resistant uh, infection caused by bacteria, various bacteria, and which is considered to be a silent pandemic. Why? Because it causes 70,000 deaths worldwide in every year and uh, uh, added to it emergence of antimicrobial resistance and lack of affordable antibiotic to address the emergence emergence of antimicrobial resistance leads to a major public health problem and it is estimated to cause 5.7 million death in various parts of the world so it is very important that the scientific community the government agency health regulator need to act unanimously to bring a, a novel antibiotic to address the uh, emergent, emergence of antimicrobial resistance. Here is the uh, slide uh, where it illustrates that how dim and uh, a desperate need to get a novel gram-negative antibacterial agent. And this is uh, 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 taken from a few trust organization, which gives the picture gives you uh, various uh, antibacterial agent in the clinical development from 2015 to 2020. What is uh, important to note here is that uh, if you look at it, novel and uh, gram-negative overlap, almost nil. Even if you consider two drugs which got approved in 2019 uh, as Avicaz and Wabamir, they are not new antibiotic with a novel mechanism, but they are uh, a newer rescue agent to rescue the old antibiotic, uh, such as the very trim situation as far as the antimicrobial a drug is concerned to address the uh, uh, emerging threat of antimicrobial resistance. So in order to develop a, a, a novel antibiotic uh, which can address the high unmet medical need, one need to understand a, a proper understanding on a drug candidate profile. So next slide. Victor, the slides are not moving. Actually, yeah, next. Okay, I've moved next now slide. to the I, slide. Yeah, I covered, I covered this slide, the next slide. Okay, sure. So, uh, uh, in, in, with respect to uh, uh, developing a track candidate profile for a novel antibacterial, one need to envisage what is the end use and unmet medical need and how it is developed. You need to start with a clinical end. What is the unmet clinical need and how safe and how uh, effective the drug and uh, to address the unmet need. 
with with keeping that end use in mind then uh, the the scientists and uh, in the various pharma company and the academic laboratory uh, build a track candidate uh, profile and which involves uh, multi parametric optimization bringing a desirable property a characteristics in a single drug is a, a, a very a challenging and needs a, a, a lot of optimization and the, the the picture illustrated in the left hand side is taken from a movie the chariot and illustrates that uh, how uh, uh, one needs to uh, the medicinal chemist in case of drug discovery need to balance and bring the fine balancing act to bring a desirable property to build a successful drug candidate profile uh, is illustrated so the the the, the next thing is that uh, in order to uh, uh, build and start a drug candidate profile one need to look at it what is the end product should look like and for example in case of a uh, novel antibacterial agent uh, what characteristics should it should the product should have whether it should have a broad spectrum antibacterial activity and it should have a dosing regimen both parenteral as well as oral whether it is effective and it is affordable and marketable in the, this one keeping that end use in mind then you look at disease indication whether you want to treat a bacterial pneumonia or urinary tract infection then look back what are the agent which is causing the this infection and uh, uh, as recently listed by a WHO agent, various priority pathogen, uh, then you build the drug discovery scientists, build the drug, can drug candidate profile and uh, travel through along the uh, drug discovery path to achieve the, the end goal. And that's so that's so the drug candidate profile uh, started uh, in, the, uh, in the drug discovery project. Next slide. Next. Next slide. I've changed it now to TCP. Where does one start? Um, so just a moment. Otherwise, maybe you can give the control to me. I will move. Yeah, it's taking a very long time. Okay, I've done that now. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah so uh, here is the uh, how uh, uh, the uh, for example what i said that keeping the uh, track product profile in mind you need to build the track candidate profile and uh, for example if you want to treat a, a bacterial pneumonia or a, a urinary tract infection or a sex transmitted disease understanding the disease biology and associated pathogen listed by who then uh, the scientists and, and the discovery, drug discovery pharma company as well as academic build a, a, a robust drug candidate profile and work towards in along the drug discovery a, a project to meet the uh, to meet the set uh, uh, drug candidate profile and as well as address the drug product which is uh, uh, capable of doing what is intended to do in terms of addressing the public health issue so in order to uh, uh, build a, a robust drug discovery, a, a, sorry, robust uh, drug candidate profile, the drug discovery uh, project needs to have a, a well-defined uh, discovery casket so that they can do a design, make test, analyze cycle in order to uh, 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 meet the various properties needed in a single compound to achieve the uh, drug candidate profile. And here is an illustration of an antibacterial project where in the bug, it is evolved in the bug works and the compound is moving along the uh, clinical development path. 
where we have indicated that uh, in the in the process of uh, discovery cascade uh, the drug candidate profile should be dynamic and it should be able to respond the uh, evolving knowledge as well as the change in the market need so as a result of it what is highlighted in the uh, blue is indicated that we have built in uh, in the middle of this one to respond and beat the comparator so that our compound will be a best in class and able to address the unmet need so the next one is that once you have a, a defined a drug candidate profile uh, linked to a cascade then we need to ask is that uh, uh, whether uh, each uh, profile can be it, each profile defined in a candidate drug profile how we can achieve it here is one example is a very important para property is that uh, how uh, the drug can assess the uh, site of infection so that it can do the job and uh, the fate of the drug in the body is defined by very important physical chemical properties like uh, lipophilicity, basicity, and a polarity of the molecule. And also we need to keep in mind that when, when, when anybody takes the drug, it, it passes through the hydrophilic environment in the GI2 and a, and a, a intestinal membrane, a hydrophobic environment to reach the systemic circulation then it needs to be distributed into a, a various tissue system which happen to be a hydrophobic environment so there is a hydrophilic hydrophobic hydrophilic hydrophobic so uh, you one one need to understand these in, uh, intricacies of these properties to balance the uh, desirable property one such property is illustrated in the right hand side is the log d log d plays a very important role in terms of uh, influencing various properties of drug molecule and it in sometimes it has an opposing uh, effect on the uh, properties of the drug so people work in the drug discovery and uh, building a drug candidate profile need to understand that we need to do a bind balance and find a sweet spot wherein you can get a balance of all the activity and that's what the the trick of the thing looks at that's why the drug discovery cycle is a very complex thing and multi-parametric optimization I shall have yeah. this movie back to the slide that you were on. So. Yeah, it's, it's taking time. Yeah, it's taking time. So the next one is uh, you have to ask is that I have a desirable uh, uh, pharmacokinetic properties like absorption, uh, distribution, elimination, and then uh, uh, whether does it meets the uh, desirable uh, uh, pro profile we set in in a track candidate profile. Next thing is that how this uh, desirable pharmacokinetic property influencing the outcome of a pharmacodynamic effect. And the left hand side, uh, yeah, a, a generic uh, a pharma, a pharmacodynamic and a pharmacokinetic relationship of the, sorry, the slide when it come to at the end. Can we go back a few slides back? Shahu is now showing for us PKPD dosing and um, regimen. Yeah, but okay. So, so if it, it, yeah 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 so uh, once we have a desirable pk then we have to understand how the pk is influencing the pharmacodynamic effect and anti infective and the left hand side the graph is giving a various parameter pk parameter influencing the pharmacodynamics of honey and the infective effect there could be three scenario wherein the pk property is driving the pharmacodynamic effect of honey and the infective for example uh, there could be a, a drug which can be uh, bringing the desirable pharmacodynamic effect by increasing the cmax or auc above the mic concentration that would be one scenario in such scenario one need to uh, address the ease of administration and safety because when when the peak concentration driving there could be a safety concern however in such in in some scenario wherein you need to achieve a concentration over a period of time above the mic which is called time over mic in that case either you can involve the novel drug delivery system or a, a split dosing regimen to achieve that one and that can help in some times so uh, to reduce the safety implication associated with the drug the right hand side as an illustration of how uh, a dosing regimen can you know, uh, can bring in a different outcome with respect to a pharmacodynamic and a pharmacokinetic relationship for example if we give a six, a six gram a day 
which is a, 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 a which can be applicable for a, a drug which is brings the pharmacodynamic effect by a peak concentration or AUC above the MIC. In this case, there could be a safety concern. Whereas if you split the dose uh, by a BID, either uh, splitting it to three gram uh, twice daily or a 1.5 gram four times a day, what it happens that your total AUC may be uh, remain same, but what you're trying to achieve by this, reducing the Cmax and increasing the time component of the MIC. By this, doing this, what you're, uh, you're understanding the dosing regimen as well as uh, it's uh, linked to the safety. So with this understanding, we need to ask is that the desirable PK and PD, if it meet the set uh, uh, target candidate profile, then we can ask whether how this compound has a relevance to in terms of therapeutic margin and therapeutic indices to meet the drug candidate profile, which is illustrated in the next slide. Victor, I am not able to move the slide. Oh, did you intend to present yeah. PKPD yeah. and safety? If yes. you just say yeah. the title of the slide that you intend to present, yeah. I'll make sure yes. that's on the slide. Yes, this is the slide. Yeah, this is the slide I would like. To. So, okay. uh, so far, whatever we had seen is that one is setting up the uh, relevant potency PK and the uh, PD relationship. Then we are asking that whether the, the compound what we are developing has a desirable safety margin or safety indices or safety window to go to further down the uh, thing. And in order to understand that the graph, uh, what is shown here is that uh, various uh, peak concentration coming out of the safety uh, studies, for example, maximum tolerated dose, no absurd effect level for a cardiotoxicity, and uh, no, uh, no adverse effect level for a general toxicity. And uh, we know that where is the efficacy Cmax and AUC lies so what you one needs to uh, 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 keep in mind that whether the drug has a sufficient safety margin at least 5x greater than 5x over its efficacy cmax and auc then we can say that this candidate qualifies in this with respect to safety window and safety margin to move into the next uh, next uh, next part of the uh, clinical development path next slide Next slide. Just a moment, Shahung, I've changed it to why do we need TCPs and TPPs now? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so, so just to summarize, uh, what is the importance and need of track candidate profile and track product profile? What one thing one one need to keep in mind that uh, track candidate profile and track product profile are a framework or a guidance principle, wherein uh, it's aimed to support and accelerate the uh, uh, development and evaluation of new clinical agent to address the unmet uh, clinical uh, need or a public health problem. And also it should be dynamic in nature. It should respond to the uh, evaluation of knowledge from uh, from the clinic side as well as the uh, as well as the uh, at the market side. For example, uh, if you if you want to illustrate with a novel antibacterial agent, uh, suppose if novel antibacterial agent needs to address the uh, 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 a gram negative infection caused by a, a carbapenem resistant enterobacteria or multidrugs resistant uh, and non fermenter then it needs to have a, a sufficient uh, uh, coverage to address that one as well as it should whether it should have a, a oral step down option so those are the learnings you need to uh, uh, incorporate in the guiding principle so that you'll be competitive enough and, uh, 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 and meet the set target profile uh, so that it it it, it serves the uh, set purpose 
and understanding a proper understanding of track candidate profile and tracking of track candidate profile also reduces the end stage risk and saves the costly failure and also you need to keep in mind that it maximizes the success that means if you have a proper uh, candidate track profile developed and uh, and dynamically changed and tracked it then it serves the uh, 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 increases the success rate and uh, reduce the failure and overall uh, goal is uh, uh, it serves the unmet need and also brings the value to the enterprises and also one need to keep in mind that it is also keep it keeps us to harness to the uh, scientists who are working it asking am i in the right track am i responding to the uh, the 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 knowledge evolving from the uh, the market dynamic as well as the clinical setting and that way if it, it, it keeps uh, harnessed uh, we have asking ourselves is that uh, whether my tpp and tcps are in alignment with uh, what i wanted to achieve it in the in the end goal so that's how it is uh, with respect to uh, tpp evolving and the tcp evolving with respect to antibacterial agent and uh, sorry for it there are a lot of disturbances in, in terms of movement of uh, slides but i would like to ask much as cover in the question and answer session thank you great <clears throat> uh, thank you so much rahul and sorry there were some technical difficulties i hope the, they have they've been fixed yeah. and i'm sure you'll have an opportunity in the q a session to provide further clarification um it's now my pleasure to welcome our next speaker daniel azinzi um daniel is an executive director of clinical r d at f2g limited uh, she's an infectious disease specialist with many years of experience in clinical research, um, having worked at institutions in Italy, as well as in the pharmaceutical industry, leading medical affairs and global R&D. Daniela also supports GuardP as a medical consultant, providing strategic advice and support across the R&D portfolio. Uh, prior to joining F2G, Daniela worked at the Catholic University Hospital in Rome and at Italy's National Institute for Infectious Diseases before transitioning to Bristol Myers Squibb and then Menarini, where she set up the anti infective RD portfolio. Daniela actively supports the European Commission as an expert advisor. Welcome, Daniela, and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Thanks, Sumati, for the kind introduction uh, and uh, uh, welcome everybody to this uh, webinar and thank you for. Uh, for your time today. So um, I would like also to uh, to thank you know uh, my uh, the, the previous speaker because uh, uh, he provided a, a very great background uh, introduction and the foundation for which I uh, I will uh, uh, go through uh, today. So um, I. Uh, I try to come to change my slide, <laughs> and uh, so the aim of my uh, of my presentation today is uh, to understand the role of a target product profile uh, to support uh, a successful development, of course, and uh, availability and access uh, of new antimicrobials. So this is a very So um, the um, I I will uh, I will work with with you uh, through uh, the the specific uh, target product profile for antimicrobial. So um, have a, a broader coverage um, and uh, uh, going through antibiotics uh, to the antimicrobial more in general then uh, try to understand what innovation uh, means uh, in the antimicrobial space and the preparedness. We are, uh, you know, uh, listening uh, several times in the last two years, uh, this, kind, this, uh, this, uh, this uh, word, uh, and uh, I hope, we all hope that the COVID situation, pandemics, you know, uh, has been uh, uh, a, 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 you know uh, taught us uh, uh, how how to be prepared for uh, uh, some uh, uh, for the pandemic, but also for uh, the this one uh, the 
led by you know very difficult to treat uh, pathogens and so how to um, to evaluate to uh, in a, in some way um, underline the added value of new antimicrobials Next slide. Thank you. So um, the, I, I would like to introduce you a very, very simple concept, but uh, uh, the, they are the basics uh, of the antimicrobial uh, field because uh, antimicrobial R&D is a very unique, uh, you know, um, framework with uh, very specific uh, challenges. Uh, the, the, the development of new antimicrobials uh, um, uh, is, uh, uh, is is characterized by high risk of failure. Since you know the the first step uh, in uh, in the preclinical uh, um, area, and then uh, um, of course uh, it is uh, a very long uh, uh, process to uh, provide the new antimicrobials to patients and uh, it takes you know uh, more than 10 years and uh, billion dollars uh, to develop a new antimicrobial so uh, it is uh, supported by very long term specific scientific expertise in this field and uh, we know that uh, due to the fact that antimicrobials were not recognized you know, um, in a proper way, um, the, um, in the in the last decades, uh, there were there was uh, um, uh, a little of you know um, disinvestment, I would say, uh, in supporting uh, new projects in this field, and so the current preclinical pipelines are in the hands of uh, small and uh, medium uh, and entities. But uh, uh, this is, you know, uh, regarding uh, the R&D. But uh, what, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, is important from, uh, you know, the scientific uh, uh, perspective and, of course, uh, uh, aiming to uh, provide these new tools to patients and implementing the use of uh, innovative uh, molecules and projects in the clinical practice. Because uh, we all know that antimicrobial stewardship strategies are uh, supporting the right uh, um, uh, use uh, of, uh, you know, that of, uh, of uh, a proper use of, uh, of antimicrobials uh, in, the, in the right patients to preserve their effectiveness. Because, uh, of course, uh, um, uh, anti, um, antimicrobials uh, can uh, become, you know, uh, ineffective when uh, um, the pathogens uh, uh, will become uh, uh, resistant. So antimicrobial stewardship is instrumental to support the rational use of uh, antimicrobials. And we need also diagnostic companion, some tools to address uh, patients and infection uh, with uh, the right and the most effective uh, um, drug or antimicrobial. So this is uh, very, very, very important. And uh, of course, uh, uh, we uh, rely on uh, the regulatory approval which is only a first to uh, get access to these uh, tools uh, for uh, patients and the clinicians, of course. So uh, there are several uh, hurdles and uh, uh, several stakeholders that uh, we need to take in consideration while uh, uh, we uh, go uh, you know, uh, from uh, the concept stage uh, to uh, to patients and uh, what uh, you know is uh, 
sorry that, that the, the next slide I'm not able to change. Thank you. Uh, so what, how we can define the target product profile in a DRT uh, microbial R&D? Uh, of course, uh, the, as I already um, underlined before, target product profile is a, a dynamic tool that uh, envision, you know, the a perfect candidate to respond to needs. need. So, um, th th there is a, a tool, a document, something very easy, but uh, that uh, can be uh, a a adapted to uh, the new data that, of course, uh, over the different phases of development, uh, we, uh, we, we will uh, uh, provide. Uh, so, the, um, in a, from, from a pharma company, from an industry perspective, uh, there, there there is a, um, a um, we, we use we use to discuss on the main features that uh, that we can uh, uh, you know um, we, we would like to uh, to have to achieve success. To respond to AMET needs, and so um, the, the the we we are used to to work, you know, in a cross-functional way, uh, involving uh, uh, different uh, um, expertise and of course uh, uh, also uh, external stakeholders. First of all, uh, patients' organization and you know uh, experts in uh, in the field. So this is a, a very complex uh, uh, process to define which are the main characteristic of, uh, uh, of our uh, product. Uh, and uh, from a commercial point of view, and of course uh, to highlight the added value of antimicrobial positioning and differentiation from competitors, uh, in the current and the future, uh, you know, uh, framework scenario are crucial to develop a, a successful, you know, uh, product. And um, uh, we rely also on very technical expertise uh, because uh, we have not only the infection, not only the patients, but also the pathogens. And uh, we uh, should stay, you know, uh, in, a, uh, in a in a framework where uh, we can uh, we can uh, uh, provide a very effective new product, but at the same uh, time with a, a very good safety uh, safety profile. So uh, the the fact that there is uh, this uh, ter this uh, third uh, factor, uh, which is uh, the the pathogen. Uh, it is uh, very important, and uh, this is uh, unique uh, uh, in, uh, uh, for, uh, for, uh, for the anti-infective uh, arena. The next slide, please. How to, uh, to introduce, you know, the product uh, characteristics? Uh, after uh, having, you know, uh, discussing and of course recognize the AMET need, we would like to target, then we need to define, you know, minimally acceptable profiling attributes of our candidate. And so we are to be very flexible in uh, moving uh, the bar uh, and uh, the threshold that we have set, you know, at the beginning, uh, since you know the discovery and uh, uh, also uh, leveraging on uh, preclinical evidence uh, we have in our hands, and uh, how to define which are uh, you know the uh, crucial need for patients, for public health. For the scientific community, uh, we uh, rely on uh, guidance from public institutions, for example, 
the WHO Global Priority Pathogen List that provide us, you know, anti uh, the, the 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 most uh, uh, critical um, uh, bacteria for which uh, R and D uh, need uh, to to work on, and of course uh, uh, we um, had to take in consideration uh, public health threats, and of course COVID was you know a lesser learned. Uh, then uh, we will uh, uh, we will like to we will uh, uh, focus on uh, uh, target age groups. Uh, we should consider safety and tolerability formulation and administration schedule so to improve convenience to patients to permit you know to um, to to have um, a, an early you know. Um, Discharge from uh, from hospital to these uh, patients. Uh, this is uh, something that is a very important in terms of quality of life for uh, for subjects, but uh, on the same time is uh, a value for uh, uh, the source uh, um, healthcare source uh, utilization. Uh, due to the fact that uh, usually the most difficult to treat pathogens and infectious disease uh, are affecting uh, very sick patients uh, that uh, who who, uh, who are managed that treated with uh, several uh, other drugs drug drug interaction uh, is uh, uh, another important point that we uh, we need uh, to to consider, and of course, uh, from uh, you know a successful point of view in terms of uh, um, uh, access to patients, uh, the competitive environment in terms of current, also foreseen future, you know, um, need uh, is a uh, is a critical and uh, comp having a companion diagnostic uh, as well. We, we are used to talk about innovation and preparedness, but uh, uh, defining innovation uh, is a very difficult uh, in infectious disease and antimicrobial uh, field uh, because uh, epidemiology and the patterns of resistance are uh, the main drivers there. And uh, we know that uh, epidemiology prevalence uh, of a specific resistant uh, pathogen change uh, by country. And sometimes we have some degrees of different, you know, uh, frequency of uh, uh, a pathogen uh, within uh, the same uh, uh, the same country. So it's uh, very, very difficult to uh, to, to, to highlight uh, the, the unmet need uh, at a global level. It is a very, very important to find alignment you know, within a company uh, uh, in a cross-functional way from uh, the, the R&D uh, to uh, regulatory or uh, to market access and uh, the, the commercial functions. Target population are often, uh, you know, very, very small due to the fact that uh, uh, they are uh, very sick patients. Uh, uh, they are very fragile, vulnerable population. So it's difficult uh, to enroll uh, this patient at a fast uh, pace uh, in, uh, uh, in clinical uh, trials and also difficult uh, to understand the clinical outcomes due to the, um, the diverse uh, uh, clinical manifestation that infection uh, uh, may have in uh, different uh, uh, population of, uh, of subjects. Uh, so uh, to target uh, the patients, to, uh, you know, talking at the patient level, the single patient level, uh, we, um, we 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 should uh, um, move uh, in a very 
careful way and uh, having you know uh, a companion diagnostic uh, will be very important and uh, is a is a crucial point uh, to be considered when uh, we uh, design uh, and uh, structure our target product profile. Innovation and preparedness um, uh, are, uh, are uh, um, very hard to be defined in this uh, space, uh, but uh, uh, is uh, uh, even more, uh, you know, uh, difficult uh, um, starting from a regulatory point of view. Because uh, this uh, uh, unique uh, characteristic uh, uh, of uh, anti-infective uh, to be uh, approved from uh, uh, regulatory agencies on the basis of non inferiority designs. So it's a very difficult then uh, looking at uh, focusing on a very limited population to identify clinical endpoints uh, and the specific time points uh, that are you know uh, recognized at a global level. And this uh, um, can lead to a very uh, poor recognition of uh, additional value of new antimicrobials and uh, its uh, impact um, heavily uh, on, uh, on, uh, on uh, the market access to these uh, innovative tools and uh, technologies uh, for the most need patients. These uh, challenges are uh, even more uh, clear uh, for uh, products uh, targeting very, very small uh, population. Uh, um, and uh, uh, we, uh, we know that uh, in, the, in the last years, uh, uh, regulatory agencies were more open to consider uh, innovative uh, pathway to get uh, market approval in uh, very special cases, uh, uh, address limited and well-defined population, the most in need one that can, you know, uh, Mm, benefit from uh, these uh, uh, new uh, new antimicrobials, and uh, so the the other uh, um, hurdle uh, in uh, in uh, in providing you know uh, a, a success for uh, for antimicrobial is uh, uh, to um, is the fact that uh, regulatory requirements are quite different between uh, you know um, uh, the uh, across different uh, different countries and uh, we are struggling also you know in having the the in, in getting the the, the, the same uh, indication at the both side of uh, of the ocean so also the the the, the evidence uh, and the um, the, the the regulatory package can differ, you know, between uh, uh, different uh, uh, regulatory uh, bodies. So it's uh, very important because it's a uh, very time-consuming and energy-consuming. Also, of course, uh, uh, need uh, uh, huge investment uh, to develop uh, um, the. A, 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 an antimicrobial at the global uh, at the global scale. So just uh, to to um, to highlight again uh, that uh, uh, due to the fact that uh, the the non inferiority trial uh, from an ethical standpoint you no know, are not uh, uh, the classical uh, ones. Uh, um, uh, that are implemented for uh, in other uh, uh, therapeutic uh, areas uh, uh, can uh, uh, impact uh, on uh, the incremental value um, uh, for uh, of this uh, uh, of these uh, antimicrobials. So, uh, from an HTA perspective, it's very difficult uh, to uh, support uh, and to define. Uh, the added value on the antimicrobials also because the models rely on very old molecules that are still considered, you know, 
uh, standard of care. Uh, and um, of course, it's uh, difficult to uh, highlight the, the, uh, the, the, the hindrance and the indirect costs uh, of this disease. Uh, for example, also uh, patient reported outcome measure are not really clear and uh, uh, the the fact that uh, um, the most of uh, the the antimicrobial uses today uh, are generic are very cheap uh, is not you know a supportive uh, for a successful uh, development uh, and uh, quick homogeneous access uh, to uh, to these uh, uh, new tools And uh, the, the last but not least aspect is uh, the patient voice. Uh, due to the fact that uh, infection uh, impacts uh, on uh, uh, different categories uh, of patients, so on a transversal uh, way, and um, the, um, it, it's uh, difficult to, to have you know, patient association supporting uh, and asking for uh, new antimicrobials. So uh, partner, partnering with uh, uh, medical uh, societies uh, uh, is uh, really uh, critical uh, due to the fact that, uh, of course, uh, uh, they can uh, have in their hand uh, uh, or uh, imagine, you know, a special population where uh, this uh, antimicrobial uh, uh, can be effective uh, and uh, uh, in order to highlight, you know, its benefit. So um, these are, you know, the most, uh, mm, the, the most uh, uh, important hurdles that we are facing every day when uh, uh, we we try to uh, to bring it to 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 the patients uh, the most uh, in need the patient uh, innovative uh, innovative uh, uh, products and um, of course uh, uh, partnering with the global institution as the WHO is a very uh, is is a, is is important is a crucial and is very most welcome in order to provide this treatment. Uh, worldwide and uh, to address critical public health threats. And the, 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 the last uh, slide is uh, uh, about you know, the pharma industry perspective because uh, um, as already you know, highlighted, and the microbials R&D requires uh, several years and a huge investment uh, to be developed and uh, the lack of proper uh, rewards in the last uh, years uh, impact on uh, the real interest and uh, of course the support in terms of funding antimicrobial R&D. Uh, we know that uh, more than 80% of the MR projects are developed by small and medium uh, uh, companies uh, and the more than 40% of these projects are focused on a pathogen specific research studies. So this is a, um, uh, a very huge hurdle because it requires also um, a, a new vision uh, you know, provided by regulatory pathways. Uh, and uh, the clear clinical development strategy my notices for some non-traditional approach. So we are relying on uh, historical control, real-world evidence, post-approval uh, committee uh, commitment study in terms uh, uh, to uh, fulfill all of the requirements uh, and in order to uh, provide uh, uh, this uh, antimicrobial uh, in the uh, uh, quickest way. We, uh, we can. So in the last years, uh, uh, the, some institutions, some associations provide a new model to partner uh, and to share risks and the resources. So to uh, share also expertise uh, across industry and public institution. And this is, a good way to work all together 
and respond to uh, very um, higher med medical needs. So in conclusion, just to wrap up uh, and uh, thank you again, uh, you all uh, for your time uh, and uh, interest today. Uh, we, uh, as, a, as a company, we are used to uh, to to find to try to find alignment uh, uh, across the different uh, um, uh, expertise uh, to uh, draft a target product profile. Of course, uh, this uh, um, uh, require uh, flexibility. Uh, of course, uh, 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 to be resilient and uh, to support uh, uh, the development uh, uh, with uh, you know very huge efforts uh, and to have always in mind our first goal uh, which is uh, the patient uh, uh, wellness uh, and uh, of course uh, to provide them with uh, the the best uh, innovative uh, uh, project we can. Thank you. Thanks, Daniela. Uh, that was a, a very good overview of the specific considerations in developing TPPs for anti-infectives. So we'll move on to um, Valeria Giganti, who's our third speaker. Uh, Valeria, I might ask you for a favor. We're running a little behind, so if uh, we can make sure we leave enough time for Q&A and time for discussion, that would be helpful. Uh, so Valeria is a team lead in the AMR division at WHO, where she coordinates research and priority setting. Valeria is a clinical pharmacologist by training and a senior regulatory affairs and health policy specialist with uh, 14 years of experience in public health. Valeria started her career at the EMA and has also worked at the Italian Medicines Agency prior to joining the WHO in 2018. And at the WHO, she contributes to several guidelines, policy documents, and publications. Uh, we look forward to hearing from you, Valeria. Thank you so much. We don't hear you. Or at least I didn't, I couldn't hear you. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Sumati, for the kind introduction. Thank you to Garpi for inviting me, and thank you to the speakers that today set the scene of a TPP from the industry perspective. That allows me to present the WHO work in this space. So WHO plays a central role in priority setting to guide R&D and align investment and resources with unmet public health need. Uh, target product profiles that follows within the prioritization ex exercise. It are one of the tools that my teams develop and maintain, available for uh, pharmaceutical companies, biotech, governments, and policymakers for R&D, uh, access, and stewardship interventions. In the industry, just be patient because these slides, they don't run. Yes. In the industry space, a TPP defines the success milestone. So they help describing how success looks like at the different stage of a product development. The success, however, is linked to the epidemiological situation that is described by the WHO bacterial priority pathogen list, as it was mentioned in the previous presentation. And the small update in this regard is that WHO is developing um, these days the first um, fungal priority pathogen list that will probably be um, published in spring and is going to revise the bacterial priority pathogen list from 2017. In the context of public health, TPP, um, sorry, I need to come back a couple of slides. No, 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 no. Yes. No, no. Today we have some issues. 
with the slide set. So um, the previous slide still. Please thank you, Victor. So in the context of public health, the TPPs set the R&D minimum and preferred target. They're intended for uh, funders and developers, and they highlight the desired performance and characteristics of needed uh, antibacterials. The development of a TPP of a TPP for, from WHO follows uh, a standard uh, procedures for developing the target product profiles. They are intended to serve developers as a uh, GARP. And these uh, four TPPs were developed because WHO actually was asked to embrace the work in this, uh, in this area. The, the process uh, to develop uh, TPPs um, is complex. As you can imagine, involve uh, several internal and external consultation with a multi-stakeholders engagement. So for uh, the WHO TPPs, um, WHO experts identified the clinical syndromes for which new antibacterial therapies are urgently needed due to increase the pathogen resistance to existing therapies. A scoping review with internal and external uh, consultation was conducted and initially five clinical syndromes were identified. One uh, of these uh, that was uh, an ICU patient focus indication was dropped out because the scope was considered too broad. So WHO in the end developed the four uh, TPPs that are the neonatal sepsis, gonorrhea, typhoid fever, and UTI. The WHO TPP have some common features. I'm trying to go to the next slide. Yes, thank you so much. Um, the patient-centric design, so WHO TPP are designed around the patients, in particular around the most vulnerable population, like women and children uh, in low and middle income countries. WHO looked at poverty-related diseases that are common in countries with inadequate water and sanitation infrastructure. This is why the choice of neonatal sepsis, typhoid fever, UTI, and gonorrhea for our first four TPP. Access and affordability of new antibacterial treatment is an essential aspect to reach universal health coverage, and is particularly important for low and middle income countries, characterized with a low level of health insurance coverage and a high level of drug resistance. Developers should promote availability at fair price. A fair price is one that is affordable for patients and health systems, but it also provides sufficient market incentive to industry to invest in innovation and in quality of medicine. Government at the same time needs to commit to ensure availability and affordability of essential new antibacterial treatment. For example, antibiotics is crucial to employ the modern reimbursement schemes that are linked to availability instead of volume. This is crucial to ensure uh, the appropriate use. Stewardship intervention uh, are essential to preserve the effectiveness of, of uh, existing authorized uh, antibacterial treatments. And developers should commit not to register the same class of products uh, for use in animals or plants or to, use, or to register this product for use in animals or plants. Manufacturing should be in line with GMP and best industry practice. Also in the management of emissions in, into the environment to minimize the uh, emergence and spread of antimicrobial resistance. Um, I presented here the, um, how the WHO TPP uh, looks like. This is a um, short version based on the preferred TPP because WHO contains minimum and preferred profiles. The, um, the first one is uh, the TPP on enteric fever. Enteric fever is caused by Salmonella tifi uh, or Paratifi and is estimated to have caused approximately 140,000 deaths in 2017, with a higher mortality in children and in elderly in low and middle income countries. MDR and XDR strains have been identified. Uh, the research today focuses on vaccines and diagnostics to prevent Salmonella tifi and Paratifi. However, the uh, preferred TPP 
for a new uh, drug candidate would be a product with a no cross resistance to existing drugs used for the treatment of enteric fever. The new treatment should have an excellent intracellular penetration and lead to a rapid clinical and microbiological clearance. It should be suitable for children with uh, both IV and oral formulations with a good bioavailability and an hepatic clearance. The next TPP is for uh, the um, diagnosed uh, complicated gonorrhea. Gonococcal infection is the second most prevalent bacterial STI in the world and is a current public health problem worldwide. Neisseria gonorrhea is estimated to cause 87 new million cases annually. There are some antibiotics currently in, um, in development and also some several preclinical programs targeting Neisseria gonorrhea. It's particularly important that drug-drug uh, interactions are considered, especially at the CYP3A4 level, um, because concomitant administration of HIV, uh, HIV drugs um, is, is, like, is likely potential. Next slide, please. Um, neonatal sepsis is a systemic infection occurring in infants less than one month old and accounts for the 15% of deaths of neonates globally. The highest burden of this disease is in South Asia and in Sub-Saharan Africa. And the um, ideal candidate should have uh, um, a good safety profile, of course, for using uh, small children in neonates and shouldn't require the um, monitor of drug levels, should prove efficacy in adults with PK data available to support um, use in all uh, age groups, including uh, neonates. Next slide. Um, the last TPP is for uh, um, uncomplicated urinary tract infection. Actually, this TPP um, uh, is uh, made by two um, uh, by two component. The UTI is cystitis in a woman is one of the most common indication for prescribing antibiotics. E. coli is the most common pathogen followed by Klebsiella pneumonia. And there is the second um, description that is um, about uh, uh, acute pyelonephritis is an UTI uh, involving the kidneys. It may be associated with bacteremia, is less common than cystitis, but can lead to fatal complication. Here, the formulations uh, sh should be tablet, capsule, but also uh, bags. The product should, uh, for the PK perspective, should present a high urinary concentration uh, and activity. Uh, and, the, um, and it shouldn't present cross-resistance to um, other therapies for the same indication. Next slide, please. So how um, a successful um, drug uh, product should look like? Well, it should have the right spectrum of action, the right PKPD and the mechanism of action with no cross resistance, an acceptable safety profile, especially in children if it is applicable. The quality should be appropriate for the intended use. It should take into account um, regarding the global epidemiology that is described by the WHO uh, bacterial priority pathogen list. And uh, ideally, it should be an innovative product because innovation is also a marker for the absence of uh, cross resistance. Next slide. And I agree with, um, with the, this panel that innovation is extremely hard to, to define. Uh, WHO is conducting routinely this uh, innovation assessment for each product in the um, WHO antibacterial pipeline analysis. So each new antibacterial is evaluated against the existing four WHO innovation criteria that are the absence of cross resistance to existing antibacterial agent, the product should belong ideally to a new chemical uh, class, uh, should have a new target and a new mechanism uh, of action. Next slide. So, um, 
some the following areas were identified for potential um, the future target product profile but w2 also could conduct a specific outreach in future on the need to, uh, to develop uh, other TPPs or uh, to revise the, the existing ones. Next slide, please. And the following these links, uh, you will uh, reach the uh, resources that have been mentioned in this presentation. I would like to, to thank everyone, the panels, the moderator, Garpi, and the participants of this webinar. Thank you so much, Valeria. Sorry, you had to rush through your slides just a little bit, but thank you for doing so. Uh, that was a great overview and many thanks for touching about pediatrics, the often forgotten patient population. So I do appreciate you bringing that up. Um, we have a couple of questions in the Q&A box uh, and we um, I would highly recommend that the uh, audience submit their questions and uh, this is how you can uh, submit your questions. And you know, we're a little short of time, but we'll try and address as many questions as we can. Um, I hope we have not lost Shahul. I don't see him online as yet. I'm Ahlabala. Okay, there you are. Okay, sorry, I couldn't see you. All right. Um, so Shahul, the first question is for you. Um, the question reads, how do you define the key pathogens for your TCP when you're dealing with a disease or condition caused by multiple bacterial pathogens, uh, for example, bloodstream infection or pneumonia with varying bacterial populations across countries and hosts, would you recommend that there be a TCP for broad spectrum and another TCP for uh, a key pathogens, it's for key uh, individual bacterial species? Was yeah. that clear? So, uh, read it again. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, so as far as the defining pathogen and uh, associated spectrum, so what we feel is that one need to take into account what is the epidemiological evidence in terms of the disease causing pathogen. For example, bacteremia, what, what are the pathogen, what is the uh, level of resistance? And similarly, uh, HAP or WAP condition, what is it contributing? In, in a critical care, uh, uh, like uh, uh, ventilated, uh, uh, hospital associated uh, pneumonia or ventilator associated pneumonia so it is time is very important so what we feel is that uh, bringing a diagnostic uh, may 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 uh, take time and also identifying a, the causative agent will also will be very uh, uh, delaying so in that case we might lose the life so in those such scenario what we feel is that uh, bringing a broad spectrum antibacterial agent addressing the existing resistant mechanism would be ideal whereas in a narrow spectrum agent what is imperative that one needs to keep in mind that uh, it allows time to develop a diagnostic and has also uh, the the disease uh, progression is very slow and there is a uh, there is a room to uh, classify and identify a pathogen. So that way the narrow spectrum would be more successful. However, there are uh, uh, pros and cons in with, with each approaches. For example, if you have a broad spectrum agent, uh, uh, your microbiome can get disturbed and there could be a concern. But you need to notice that uh, antimicrobial treatment is for one week, it's a short course. It's not a, a, a metabolic disease or a cancer, you lifelong will take it. So your microbiome can regrow, but uh, life is very precious in those scenario. I think the uh, the broad spectrum would add a lot of value. Hope I have answered. Yep. Okay. Wonderful. Um, thank you so much, Rahul. And then this, uh, we have another question which is directed to all three of you. So I think each of you can take a chance uh, at answering it. It's, it's if you would be able to share uh, your favorite. TPP or TCP, I think more so that it can be a learning experience for those of the uh, listening into this webinar. If you can think of any in your uh, uh, in your experience over the years. Okay, L let me go first. Okay, sure. I can take a short. So, as far as the uh, antibacterial TPP or a candidate drug profile is concerned, is that uh, uh, I think one needs to aim for an aspirational TPP, which would cover a, a high unmet need. For example, when it comes to 
and, uh, and, uh, and antibacterial uh, drug resistant infection happened while in uh, intra-abdominal infection and caused by a, a carbapenem resistant enterobacteria as well as a MDR uh, pathogen is very important. So a broad spectrum agent would be an ideal uh, spectrum with a parenteral oral step down option so that it's it is commercially viable to address it. So in order to make sure that this compound is well characterized with respect to the CMC aspect, uh, drug substance and manufacturing and control because which plays a major important role uh, when it goes to clinical development and life cycle is concerned, you need to have an ideal stability and ease of access and manufacturing, all those aspects in come into play. So uh, I think, uh, uh, a broad spectrum agent with a parenteral and a, a oral step down option would be a, a, a great to go behind for a critical care infection. Okay, I see there are a few more questions in the in the Q and A box. If it's okay with you, I'll move on to the next set of questions. We'll try and cover as many as we can. Um, so there's a question for you, uh, Valeria, and uh, it's specifically asking if WHO would be interested in supporting startups with early discovery programs? Well, WHO in many senses is, um, is well engaged with the scientific communities, with uh, um, large companies, but also biotechs and uh, smaller companies. So um, I think that uh, there are already some programs that we have, like, uh, for instance, our um, public consultations are, uh, of course, uh, um, addressed to everyone in the scientific community, uh, and probably would be uh, really interesting in future to develop uh, even something uh, more specific for, um, for smaller uh, startups. Okay, great. Um, Daniela, maybe the next question can you can address. Uh, it's not so much about TPPs necessarily, but I think the question is more to do with, can you evaluate a new antibacterial candidate for non-inferiority compared to standard of care for treatment of non-resistant infections and superiority against standard of care for resistant infections? It's a very, very, very tricky, tricky question, uh, and uh, I'm, I, uh, I'd like to to take it. Um, non inferior to um, to non resistant infection, maybe uh, the the L value can be, you know, um, can regard the formulation or uh, you know the, the 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 safety or tolerability profile, um, uh, and also maybe drug interaction, for example. Uh, so in this uh, uh, in this way uh, we, uh, we can measure you know the uh, efficacy in terms of non inferiority, but uh, uh, leveraging on uh, different characteristics uh, to highlight you know the added value. For uh, the um, superiority, uh, from an ethical perspective, uh, in infectious disease uh, uh, regulatory and of course also the are not uh, you know supportive uh, to, um, to to run this kind of uh, trial superiority uh, uh, because of course due to the fact that we are dealing uh, uh, sometimes with often I would say with uh, very um, with with, uh, with with infection uh, um, that have a, a really high bar in terms of mortality. It is uh, not, you know, uh, ethical to treat uh, uh, patients uh, with uh, a drug that you supposed to be superior. So the other one is uh, inferior, for definition. And uh, so um, the, 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 the clinical trials uh, uh, designed from a statistical standpoint are, uh, of course, non-inferior, but then. Uh, uh, there will be, you know, postdoc analysis uh, or uh, some uh, uh, further analysis that can, you know, highlight the superiority in terms of overcoming resistance, so targeting different specific, uh, very difficult tree pathogens, or uh, then uh, in terms of uh, very hard endpoints, for example, mortality. This is uh, something that can be, you know, done after uh, the um, on top of you know the the primary endpoints state yeah and if i can just add um, uh, daniela to what you just said 
I think certainly, um, if, if I understand the question correctly, it's, there's almost a suggestion about whether it's possible to do a nested NI superiority design, and that's certainly a possibility. I think the important thing to keep in mind is that the non-inferiority, in the non-inferiority comparison, you're comparing yourself with effective therapy, otherwise the non-inferiority comparison is, is questionable. And then in the subset of patients that have infections due to the resistant organisms, would there be a possibility okay. to demonstrate superiority? I think a lot really depends there on how many patients with the particular resistant phenotype are enrolled, but then also to make sure that in the overall population, the comparator arm actually has activity against the uh, the pathogens of interest. So um, uh, there are there is at least one guidance document that's available from the FDA that lists the various trial design options for patients with unmet need, and in addition to the traditional NI and superiority trials, uh, there is certainly mention of the nested NI superiority design, um, so that might be a good reference if uh, if uh, you've been if someone would want to look at. Uh, and Thanks, I think you, No problem. Okay. I think you know completely yeah. the, the 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 question. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, no worries, no worries. And I think your point about the difficulty in doing a superiority trial is it's really about the difficulty in demonstrating superiority, uh, given that most available therapies, however ineffective they are, at least tend to have some activity. And so um, uh, there are plenty of examples where attempts to demonstrate superiority haven't necessarily been successful, though they are the much easier trials to interpret. Anyway, so we'll move on to, sorry, Daniel, I, I just thought I could add to your response. I hope that is okay. No, just um, just if I can uh, to add, uh, you know, on this uh, uh, now getting, you know, the 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 the, the question as it is um, to uh, th that the difficulties is then uh, to identify, you know, uh, a a sample size that can demonstrate, you know, superiority. This is uh, the way. Uh, it's uh, difficult to run, you know, a pathogen-driven trial, but on the same time, if you uh, you know, target uh, a, 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 a infection site, so an indication uh, targeting an infection site, atomical site, then it's very uh, difficult to demonstrate superiority when, uh, you know, the pathogen uh, isolated uh, with the resistant, with the specific resistance are uh, very, you know, you um, know, uh, are, are in, a, in a small number. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, Daniela, sorry, the next question is probably for you as well. Again, not specifically regarding TPP, so let me know if you're comfortable with this. Um, it's about a host immune response. So, some bacterial infections have a clear modulation of the host immune response. What is the view on, com on combining, so combination of antimicrobials with immunomodulators to mitigate pathogenic immune responses and or improve protective immunity? Sorry, and or improve protective immunity. Uh, this is a very, very interesting, uh, uh, and uh, of course, um, mm, the for example, uh, uh, we know that some, you know, in uh, in the anti antifungal uh, space, uh, there is uh, this uh, kind of interaction uh, between, you know, the pathogen and uh, immunity. Uh, and immune response. Uh, of course, uh, uh, to me, what uh, you know uh, need to be studied uh, on top of uh, the clinical uh, outcome are uh, you know all uh, the biomarkers uh, leading you know, to this. So, first step to understand which are you know the most reliable markers, and then of course uh, to uh, have them as you know secondary endpoints uh, in uh, in the study. I don't know if you if you all uh, uh, you know agree on that. It's not a simple question uh, and environment. Right. Yeah, I know we're we're almost um, close to the end of our time. But there's one question that I I think we should touch upon before we hand it over to Victor and. Maybe if each of you can quickly comment, give you a minute or so, please comment on using TC, TCP and TPP as tools for communication between various stakeholders, including regulatory agencies before approval and physicians and patients after approval. I think this is a very important um, 
message uh, from this webinar. So we'd love to hear from each of you quickly. Yeah, I think uh, uh, TCP and TPPs are a guiding principle and uh, uh, the the stakeholder has to take a ownership. Most of them, what happens, the ownership is questionable and that's where the things can get uh, go wrong. So it's very important that the, that the stakeholder takes the ownership of this one. And another thing is that, the, uh, as I said in the, my, my talk also, that the TPP should be on a a dynamic document and it is not a, a, a written a policy that uh, one needs to respond to what is happening the change in the market field as well as the clinical setting that is very important and accordingly the parameter needs to be if uh, uh, looked into the, when it whether the candidate uh, the candidate uh, profile meets the uh, target product profile and it should not be uh, tuned to what you have that is most important as far as that and the tpp and tcp is concerned Okay, uh, Valeria, do you want to respond? And I would also love to hear from you about um, uh, including the voice of the patient, because I think that's very important and needs to be thought of early on, not just um, as at the end of the whole process. So maybe you can comment on that as well. Thank you so much for this. Actually, yeah, what the WHO is trying to do is to give voice to the most vulnerable population, to the most unserved communities, and to try to understand what are the needs also in low and middle income countries where they might have more difficulties to advocate for themselves or might not have the needs to advocate for themselves. This is why we are trying to choose this therapeutic area to, um, to address an important public uh, health, public and met uh, needs. Uh, and we hope that uh, designing WHO TPP in uh, like minimum and preferred requirements, between the minimum and the preferred requirements, we will reach um, an ideal and suitable candidates to address uh, the needs of this uh, population. I can also add that the partnering, you know, uh, across uh, different uh, stakeholders will be, you know, an enrichment for uh, everyone and for patients in particular. Okay, great. Uh, now, I didn't expect this, but it looks like there is a question for me, even though I'm not the one supposed to be answering questions. Um, so let me see if I can answer, uh, let quickly read through that uh, question. So it says, what do I, as a previous regulator, feel about clinical pathways for non-traditional therapies like phage therapy? Um, uh, so I think, you know, irrespective of what the product is, whether it fits the paradigm of what's considered traditional or, what's, or it's a non-traditional or rather more innovative therapy, I think what's important is that the trials that are designed have to be scientifically sound and the endpoints and the assessments that are made are meaningful to patients. So it's it's less about just what the regulators want. I think what as a group we have to work towards is designing trials that are scientifically sound and actually really means at the end of the day make a difference to patients. So non-traditional therapies um, I think are mean different things to different people. But if you look at it from a very broad perspective, you're talking about something other than small molecule, uh, it'll really depend on what the what this product is and how it is likely to be used, i.e., is it a standalone product? Is it going to be used instead of an antibacterial? Or is it, or is it something that will be used in addition to the standard of care? And then those will necessarily play a role in determining what the trial design is. In the latter, it will more likely be a, a superiority design where it is test agent plus standard of care versus standard of care. Um, so I'm sorry, it, it's hard to give an answer in 30 seconds to this very complicated question, but uh, uh, I, I do recollect that a few months ago, maybe the middle of last year or so, there was a public workshop that colleagues at the Center for Biologics and NIH had put together specifically on phage therapy, and that might be of interest uh, 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 for, for people to look into. So, um, Victor, I know we are uh, out of time, it's, and um, so I think we need to wrap up. Have I missed any questions? I don't see any others in the Q&A box. So I think we captured most of the questions. Uh, so before I turn this back to Victor, uh, I, like to thank all of you for joining us today. 
We hope you found today's webinar useful. Sincere apologies, there were some technical difficulties, so we ended up having to shorten the Q&A session a bit. Many thanks to Shahul, Daniela, and um, Valeria for your presentations and for fielding the questions. And also thanks to Victor and Astrid for their support with the logistics. So Victor, back to you. Thank you, Samati, for moderating today's Q&A and webinar. And of course, thank you very much, Shahul, Daniela, and Valeria for your presentations today. And apologies for the slight technical issues um, during the webinar. So our next webinar will be on the 26th of January, and this will be on new technologies and strategies to overcome the challenges of sexually transmitted infections. This webinar will consist of presentations that were given at the satellite se um, session during the ICASA conference, and there will be a panel discussion as, um, as well as these presentations. You can already register for this webinar on the Revive website, and you can also watch the recordings of this webinar and our previous webinars on the website and read antimicrobial viewpoint articles and access the resources. So that will be all from us today. Thank you everyone for joining and for contributing to the discussion. I hope you found the webinar useful and will join us again in the future. Please do spread the word amongst your colleagues um, to join as well. Thanks again and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.